being to order. Cheryl says he can't hear. Can Tony and Chris, can you guys hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Okay, Gerald, it sounds like it's on your end. But he can't hear you say that. <laughs> um, you want to type it in the chat? Too. Yeah. Um, so while Ryan is working that out, it's okay. Gerald's time is in a little bit, so we've got time to solve this tech issue. So I will call the meeting to order at 5.39. And the first item on our agenda is the opportunity for the public to address the committee. I don't see anyone here from the so I will declare public comment closed. The second item on our agenda is staff reports, and there is a annual comprehensive financial report that uh, there's a link to our website, and I will ask. Yep, I just yeah. wanted to let everyone know that our fiscal year 23 audit reports were filed at the end of May. Um, our auditors were not available to present this evening. They were going to come to the July meeting, but maybe that date will be to be determined. Uh, but they will be at our next meeting able to present the audit. But I did want to put the link there in case people wanted to see the reports, which are all available. Were there any particular concerns, comments, or surprises? No, nope, there are all, th all three of the reports had clean opinions. Um, and we did get a management letter with some recommendations. Um, year end closeout, which I know we are already working on. Um, some it's an IT item about a fraud hotline, which I found one for two hundred and fifty dollars, and then uh, an item to review our cybersecurity and have a little bit of additional testing done. And I'm already working with IT to make sure that we get that implemented for next year. Was there anything in their report that you disagreed with? Nope, there was not. Great. Okay. Um, so stay tuned for that, Chris. Um, you may have caught the tail end of this as you tuned in, but uh, I am on actually on vacation, it looks like, for both of our next regular meetings. So we will look to have... Now you, hold on. you're on vacation, I assume, next for our next meeting? For July and for our regular meeting in August. And so okay. we will look to find a special meeting time, maybe before the second council meeting in July, where we can meet. Okay figure out the timings if so we don't conflict with personnel. There's no yeah. personnel tonight, is there? No, there's not. We flip. Okay. Um, all right. The next item on our agenda then is approval of minutes from our last meeting. Is there a motion to approve? I move that we approve the May 9th, 2024 minutes as presented. Is there a second? Chris? I will second. Second. Uh, is there any discussion, additions, or corrections to the minutes? All right, seeing none, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Minutes are approved. All right, the next item on our agenda is old business, and the item of old business that we have this evening is uh, the ARPA unallocated funds. Um, just sort of short, I guess, short introduction for me. We've been talking about this before. This is uh, the dollars that we need to have essentially out the door by the end of the calendar year. And so there's two pieces to these. One is stuff that we have allocated as a council that we don't think we can get out the door or under contract. Uh, well, but obligated with a very specific meaning from the federal government that means under contract or spent. Um, and then things, there's there's a chunk of money that we have not actually obligated that we need to obligate and we'll decide what to do with and obligate by the end of the year. So with that, I will turn it over to the staff who can go over them. So we had mentioned this at our previous meetings, knowing that there is the impending deadline of December 31st and wanting to make sure that we get to utilize these funds for what the council wants to use these funds for, we are going to be proposing that we authorize the ARPA money towards roads and then take the funding that was authorized for roads and move it back into CNR until the council can slowly, much slowly, but go at their pace in terms of authorizing um, the projects. This will have no impact on future budgets because it's a one for one dollar transfer. It's really just an accounting mechanism that will allow us to carry these funds forward past December 31st without having any implications with the federal government. The only thing I might add, um, because we have been in 
we received these funds over two tranches way back when, and so we've actually had the funds, and you know they've been in, invested in our accounts and they've been earning interest. So we've talked a lot about interest that has been earned on town funds, and I just want to make it clear that you know the essentially the buying power of the dollars we got from the federal government has increased over time based on that return on investment, and so our ability to complete work with the federal funds is not diminished as a result of the, the delay on the portion that we haven't expended yet. Okay. In terms of um, so it looks to me like there's about $1.6 million that we did not decide what to do with and my recollection is that there was sort of a variety of reasons for that. One was there was a large project that Public Works had recommended that the council decided not to move forward with, which was to bring uh, public water to Mansfield Middle School. Mm -hmm. And then um, there was a chunk of dollars, at least, that we were looking at essentially waiting for the Parks and Recs rec study to be completed. But that's... And that piece, conceptually, you did, I think, vote, signal an intent to use those funds, two things, Parks and Rec, and then $350,000 for affordable housing. So you guys have gone on the record officially saying you want to use it for those broad purposes, but that's not the same thing as obligating it for a specific project. To your point, the remainder, the 700, I guess, 31,000 roughly, um, the, the biggest reason why those funds exist, to your point, is the public water project that essentially the council just didn't, didn't want to act on at all at that time. Um, and so then I guess from my other question is from staffs, from your perspective, this would put aside 1.6 million into CNR, into its own sort of bucket in CNR, and then the council would have, um, what would, what would we then do? You what would you recommend that we you do? You would then, I... Probably do exactly what we've been doing and appropriate those funds as projects become available. Right, on a project basis. Yes. So hypothetically, to use the funds, the 565,000 recreation open space asset improvements, uh, which you guys will recall that started off at three quarters of a million. So some things have already been used, like Sunny Acres improvements, some other things, but the bulk of it, like you said, waiting to see how the Parks and Rec master plan shook out. So now we have some recommendations. Pretty soon we're going to have specific projects we want to move on. Um, so what staff would bring to the council is a project level proposed investment that would obligate the funds to a specific thing from CNR. And so would you, so your plan would essentially be to come to us with a, here's how we would like to spend $1.6 million, not, oh, here's a project that came up and it'll be 300,000. And so we'd like to draw down 300 from this. And then I move. do think it could be in chunks. I would anticipate, yeah. Um, I would say so because since it's not ARPA money anymore in terms of that's sort of the beauty of this. You can you can authorize that money for open space and affordable housing almost immediately once they're moved to CNR. You don't have to wait for Parks and Rec to come up with a plan or anything like that. Maybe you'd like to see that plan before authorizing it, which would, would also be, be fine. Right, from wrong, it'd be analogous to what the council's already done with land acquisition. Right. Right? You could create an account. Yes, it'll have it. its own account. Yeah. Right, but then obviously if there was ever a specific drawdown, like a acquiring land, then that would be different. So yeah. Yeah. Yep. That was okay. going to be my cost. Okay. Um, so you don't think it would, like we, we don't need to, make, to recommend like policy for the dollars or anything. I don't like think that. so. I think it's just going to be important that my office tracks it separately from the rain. Right. So we're not absolutely funds. sure that mm -hmm. the, the intent that when it was in ARPA, that that's ultimately those dollars are spent for. Okay. Well, Ben, can I ask a question? Is I ask a, both. I have two things. Has there been any renewed interest in the bringing the water to the middle school? I mean, that seems to have fallen off the plate, and uh, I would be perfectly happy if that were true. But I'm just wondering if anything has developed on that front. I, I wouldn't say anything really new. I mean, uh, we have conversations periodically with Connecticut Water about, you know, they ask <clears> us. There any system expansion, you know, efforts or projects the town would be, and this is one that we continue to say, well, you know, I mean, all it's being equal, we wouldn't 
we, I mean, we would like to see it happen. The question is, are you prepared to make like your own investment to make it happen? If Connecticut Water came to the town and said, hey, you know, uh, we have access to resources. It's a priority for us. We want to do this. We think the density's there. Does the town want to see us? The answer, I think, would be yes. I don't think the council was a, ever opposed conceptually to the project. It was a recognition that it was a pretty substantial investment of ARPA dollars and then just a right. question. The, and there was nothing from the school board to really push this. There was rationale. I mean, the, the then superintendent. No, I know, I know rationale at the time, and and I know the argument, but nothing. There has been no development since we re originally considered this that would make it more pressing. No, remember, and, and probably bears repeating anyway. Even if you do, there were two pieces to this. The the biggest piece from a financial outlay standpoint was bringing public water. And there's a couple different routes that it may have happened to get there in terms of, you know, Maple Road or down 195 and Spring Hill, basically equidistant, but different service line. And obviously, depending on which route you went, that was the big biggest ticket item. But not to be lost in, in this was also discussion about the plumbing internal to the building and the issues that because that's a 1960s construction and, and not unlike the the village elementary schools, the neighborhood schools, and the issues with the plumbing there. Um, I think facilities continues to be mindful of, concerned about, you know, when is the middle school going to start having similar leaching problems from the solder? Um, and so I couldn't quote an exact number. It's hundreds of thousands of dollars, though. We talked about, and there's state grants, uh, other sources of funding we might use for that, but ARPA could be one of them to basically do an overhaul of the plumbing. In, internal to the building, even if the water supply, the water source continues to be a private source. Okay, that's another question altogether. All right, the other thing I was, I, I've been thinking is, you know, there's some things we know we want to do, like build an animal shelter, but we couldn't get the contract signed in time by December, the end of December, because they're just too much preliminary work, plus the question of where is it going to be located. So, yeah. yeah uh, I now understand this, but um, in a way it's irritating because we've got the money and we just operate <clears> so slowly we can't spend it yet. Well, I know the deputy mayor's made a point, which I think is a valid one, although I haven't heard of anything in the works, you know, this this hypothesis that Congress will do something to extend this, to, to you know, extend out the obligation deadline, if not the, the 2026 deadline that you have to have the funds expended. but. Um, hasn't happened yet, not a guarantee that it will. So this is just, you know, kind of a safety net to guard against no no extension. Yeah, it's kind of shocking how little uh, this, I mean, again, same thing that I said when we started talking about this six months ago, it has to be just absolutely billions, if not hundreds of billions of dollars across the country that mm -hmm. is in this exact boat and not every municipality, not every governmental entity, state, certainly not states, can do what we can do with it. Most are bigger than us. Um, counties, I, I mean, there's just, it doesn't, but whatever, I, I think this makes sense. Um, I think this also, frankly, helps us make decisions like expanding utilities to the middle school or somewhere else as quickly or as slowly as we want to, and it doesn't put sort of an artificial ARPA related deadline on making a decision like that, where obviously there's a direct impact on a town building that's important, but there's also then potential future impacts on location of development. As soon as you start running utilities sure. into a new part of town, you get the ability from an environmental perspective to build more dense everything. And um, that's always been my issue with this project is it's just not, the route to get there, neither of the routes to get there have been where the Planning and Zoning Commission has looked towards for um, for future development. And so it seems like a large expend, like expenditure of resources to a place where the only benefit, like there would be no beneficiary in terms of the ability to build more dense businesses or housing or whatever there. And, and the, because the PZC said, hasn't said we should do that there. Um, so. Anyway. Yeah, the, the one project in the future, the status is certainly very unknown and doesn't look like anything is happening right away, but the property that Masonic Air owns, sure. that would be the one exception. But that's right across the street from where we're already running. 
water and sewer. Right, it's pretty, the, it's pretty the close. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, so I'm, I'm, I, I think this makes sense. I think we should just, you know, sort of be clear with the council that we're not just sort of setting aside dollars for whatever that we're going to use in due time. We're going to use these dollars the way that the council would have used them if ARPA dollars had the ability to be spent forever. I guess my only other question from like an obligation perspective is for things that we've been doing with ARPA. Is there any thing that's like not sort of capital project related, but that's like ending that staff have seen a lot of success with that we might have the ability to extend either with these dollars directly through ARPA or by so putting them somewhere other than CNR. We previously came and extended farms to families another season because staff had recommended or requested that they had additional funds for that. Um, I can touch base with a few others. Um, I know there are some of them that are still struggling to spend down their money by December 31st. So I have been reviewing those quarterly with all of the department heads. Okay. And there's nothing like pandemic preparedness wise, future pandemic preparedness wise that we need? Yeah, I mean, I can certainly check back in with Rob Miller. It's been, it, I'll admit, it's been a while since we had around the sort of the public health and pandemic proofs, proofing sort of, um, obviously the focus on COVID has shifted a great deal. At the time, you know, everything we'd done because as I think we all know, we, we as a town actually um, have made and continue to make through some of these projects that are yet to happen a fair amount, a fair amount more direct investment in public health sort of precautionary stuff relevant to what other towns did that used it for just any sort of project. Or, you know, so, so in some ways we've already done more, but there could have been some advances, some changes in the last 18 months that Rob's aware of, but we just haven't circled back to say, is there anything else you at this point would recommend that we do? So happy to have that conversation. Chris, how does this, um, get affirmed? In other words, how do we, and who do we have to convince that indeed we do have these monies encumbered? Um, and, you know, is it is it like town finance managers that discuss how this is best practices or do we do this through, a, what, what's the process? So the federal government's the one who's outlined the, the definition of obligate, which again means you have to have the sign contract or the purchase order um, in terms of Monitoring, there's an annual report we have to file with them to tell them what has been obligated and what has not been obligated and what the purpose is for each of them. It's a very basic report. So there's that's that's about it. We send that directly to Treasury, is that good OPM? It goes to Treasury. And this um, road project, which mm -hmm. is what we're saying it's going to, we have contracts or whatever that are in it, at least that amount. Mm -hmm. actual we will be able to encumber that much money by the end of the year, yes. Absolutely. And as I recall, without looking at it right now, it is the entire amount now yeah. that we're doing. And just, just so that we don't have to worry our, about it to, anymore and we can just go forward. Yep. With the okay. All right. Well, if everybody is satisfied, then there's a motion to recommend this plan to the council. You want to plan I have to dig out on the computer. Are you going to get it? I'm going to get it. Yes. Okay. okay, so I'd like to move to recommend that the town council appropriate one million six hundred forty-five thousand seven hundred thirty-eight dollars and fifty cents from ARPA fund for the capital project road resurfacing. Any other part? That's it. Second. Oh wait, there's a second second. There's a second aspect of it. Would you like me to read that at this point? Yes. Yes. Okay, I'd also like to move to recommend the town council reduce the appropriation of road resur resurfacing um, made from the capital non-recurring fund in the amount of $1,645,738.50. Funds shall be returned to the capital non-recurring fund and held until council's future appropriation. Second. Is there any further discussion on it? Right, let's vote. All in favor say aye. aye. Okay. All right, it passes. We will, it's on our agenda tonight, right? Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, we were moving to new business now, and the next uh, item is to transfer uncollected taxes to property tax with the dispense book. I'll turn it over to staff. Correct. So, this is an activity that we do once a year. 
our collector of revenue reviews all of the accounts and identifies accounts that he believes are to be uncollectible. Uh, and that total this year is 63,170.82. Again, the majority of them are motor vehicle and personal properties for people who have left town or abandoned mobile homes and or businesses that have closed. So again, this is a standard annual activity that our collector of revenue does. And he's here. He is here for this item and the next, if he wants to add to that or if people have um, additional questions for him. And just out of curiosity, because um, I, I went through the list mm -hmm. and saw different types, abandoned mobile homes and what, what do we do with them? What happens there? I don't know. Gerald, do you know what happens with the abandoned mobile homes? They go silent. Star six to unmute, Gerald, if you can hear us. He said he called in. Yeah, I think he's. There he is. Looks unmuted. You there, Gerald? Do you hear us? <laughs> <laughs> but Hello? Is he uh, new to unmute? Oh, it's away. So, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Got it. Um, so yes, abandoned mobile homes are court ordered abandoned. Um, so a mobile home park um, will go to go to court and get that designation for mobile homes that have been um, left abandoned, you know, whether the um, property owner is deceased or they have um, moved on and just left their mobile home there on the mobile home park. Um, so what happens is we essentially have to suspend the tax and then the mobile home park owner can remove the mobile home and put a new one on. So is part of Dr. Cotton's question, or Mr. Keep, I can't remember who asked now, but uh, Dr. Cotton's question, um, whose responsibility it is to do something with the right. unit? And can we get any revenue from... Right, so the unit has might have some value. So I guess maybe the question being asked, Gerald, is who does what with the unit? Who gets the value of the unit in the case of a mobile home specifically? Um, they usually just scrap it because they are they're usually in pretty rough shape. So the mobile home park will usually you know demo it and then put a new one on the pad and then sell that. And then we would get the tax revenue from the new unit. New unit, yeah. But so, yeah, but it was the tax revenue from the new as opposed to any clawing back value from like the sale of the old Correct. unit or something. So, yeah. Is, um, I'm not sure who I'm asking this question of, but is is this amount about typical yes. on an annual basis? Yeah, I think last year was 45 ish, so it was a little bit uh, so lower. Then there but was a, here. another number just sitting out there, which was we usually get about $12,000. Something I forget how it's correct what, what, twelve to fifteen thousand dollars because people can still if someone comes in and attempts to make a payment on a suspended account we will gladly still take that payment so we do still collect twelve to fifteen thousand dollars on the accounts that are sitting in suspense it just okay. moves it to us so my question related to that was you would get that would be about a quarter of the amount that you had last year what's the percentage or what's the typical um, slow return on the on these suspended I would things. have to look back historically on Gerald that. do you have a sense of it at all do you keep track of that kind of thing um we usually budget for I think around seven thousand a year to collect and suspense taxes and if someone moves to the suspense list they're like their DMV hold remains right so if you if one of these folks goes to try to register a new car or their existing car or whatever, the DMV will still tell them, sorry, you right. can't do that until you pay Mansfield, whatever you owe them. Is that that's right? Yes, that is correct. Yep, absolutely. So good, thank you. And and the other thing I'm I don't didn't fully understand um, it was the a contract with uh, Home and Common. So that's actually for the next item. That's not really it. 
In the okay. packet, it accidentally got put in two times. So okay. that is for the next item, not related to tax suspension. So this is something we handle internally. We don't give it up. We just say. We don't think this is the related. We just move it over to, the, to the unfortunate situation. Yes. What do you call suspended? Suspended, yes. Okay. So, Tony, you have a question? Yeah, don't we do send some of it to a collection agency? No. That's, I think, the we next do not. Part. Really? I thought we did. Okay. Why? Well, we send motor vehicle. We do send motor vehicle um, taxes that are unpaid to a collection agency. So, yes, some of these accounts would are still with the collection agency, American National Recovery Group. However, we don't send the suspense list to them, to the collection agency. So what do they get? The collection agency? Yeah. So after about a year of, not even a year, probably less than that, six months of non-payment for taxes and sending out numerous delinquent notices, we'll send those bills to the collection agency for them to collect. They have different skip tracing methods that we don't have access to, to find people that move to other states. Um, so yeah, some of these accounts that are in suspense are still with the collection agency, so they can still collect on it too, just like we can. They're basically an extension of us. And what percentage of, the, of what they collect do we get? All of it. All of it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, they so they attack on a fifteen percent fee, um, mm -hmm. so that's that's what that's what they make is the fifteen percent fee collection agency fee. If if you send it to the collection agency and the person walks in here and gives you the whole the thousand dollars, do we still have to give them one hundred fifty bucks because we have a contract on that particular suspended account? Yes. But Jerry, I'll just be clear, you're saying that the collection fee is tacked on on top of our 100%. Correct. Yeah. You know, we're not we're not taking 85% of all. We're, we're getting 100. Person pays it, now they owe 15% on top of it because of the collection fee. Mm. Thank you. So, so when the collection agency calls them for their $1,000 bill, the bill the collection agency charges them $1,150. That's how collections works. Yeah. Cool. I'll try to get my taxes in, Cheryl. Get them in. All right. So this is this is a normal thing. We do this every year. So um, this is a, a motion that we have on the on page ten. I think we have page nine. I think it's from <laughs> okay. I move effective June twenty fourth, twenty twenty four, to recommend the town council authorize the transfer of sixty three thousand one hundred and seventy dollars and eighty two cents in uncollected property taxes to the Mansfield property tax suspense book as recommended by the collector of revenue. I'll second that. Is there any further discussion? All right. Then I'll put all in favor, raise your hand. All right. All right. It passes. The next one, item. One question. Any objection to its going on the consent agenda? No, I think that's an excellent idea. Is it not already on the consent agenda? It is on the consent agenda. Yeah. I think she's yes. trying to foreshadow if something's going to get pulled from this group. Okay. Um, the next item for new business is the appointment of legal counsel for a tax sale. So um, shortly after I started, our collector of revenue, uh, who again is present here today, um, reached out about doing a tax sale for the town. It has been a significant amount of years since we've done our last tax sale. And there are some, there are several accounts that are significantly delinquent and we should be looking into doing this. Uh, per the guidance of the town attorney, that policy really comes from the revenue collector himself. So Gerald has drafted a policy which is attached on page 42 and 43 of your packet, uh, which would have the tax sale be for any real estate delinquency that has been late for at least three grand lists and at least $15,000 who has not made payments in the last four months, a real estate delinquency on a single parcel that's abandoned, uh, anyone who has a sewer UC or sewer assessment fee that is five years delinquent, and commercial properties with more than two grand list years in arrears. Um, so the item that, we're, this is not going to the full council tonight because we wanted to just bring it up conceptually before 
doing that. But in order to do that, we are interested in hiring an attorney. All attorneys must be approved through the town council. So we have brought to you the biography of Adam Cohen, who is the tax sale guru for the state of Connecticut. He does tax sales all year long. He's, he's an expert at that, in my opinion. I've worked with him two times prior in my time in Coventry. Um, so we just wanted to bring this to you guys tonight, get your feedback, um, and see if there were any questions, thoughts, comments. And again, Gerald's here as well, if there's anything he wants to add to that. So maybe just in the most basic, like what's a tax sale? What are we talking about? Carol. I'm sorry, is there a question? How many properties and how many? No, well, what's a tax sale? Like, what are we yeah. talking about here? Oh, sure. Um, so the tax sale, um, you want to know how many properties? Well, just a definition. What, let's start with what a tax sale is, then we can talk about how many properties this would bring into play. Okay, so it's essentially a foreclosure um, because of failure to pay taxes. Um, and um, like Amanda said, um, Adam Cohen does the tax sale procedure. Um, I believe he does title searches to find um, like relatives or other interested parties and notifies them and follows the, you know, the, uh, the uh, legalities to the, to the T um, essentially. So yeah, it's just basically a foreclosure for non-payment of taxes. And maybe anticipating a possible other question, when the value of a property dramatically exceeds the back taxes not paid, mm. what happens in that situation? Um, well, that's, I know a lot of people have come to us saying, you know, they owe a few years in taxes and they're like, oh, we have the property up for sale. And um, from the proceeds, we're going to pay the, the taxes off. And oftentimes that that's possible. That's the that's the case. But sometimes they fall just too far behind, and it's or they don't want to sell. Period. So I have compiled a list of properties um, that fall into this range, and um, we decided to go with a medium assessed value of the town times three years um, to get the fifteen thousand dollar um limit of the town not the property itself well i think what you're saying is the medium you're saying the median uh tax so basically the property taxes on an, on a median valued home times three years yes exactly yep median value of home going back to the town meeting slides it's Somewhere in the neighborhood of five thousand dollars is what the property tax bill is. So that's where the fifteen thousand percent. Right, Gerald? Correct. Okay, thanks. Is yes. it, well, is that um, common practice in tax collectors' offices in the state of Connecticut, in New England, or anywhere else? Is it? What's the? What are some? Yes, it is. I don't know if you heard Mr. Keith. Sorry, you cut out at the end there. Mr. Keith, I'm curious if there are any other like alternatives, not to second guess your recommendation, but I just think- I wonder if there are other methodologies with the other... for doing this, philosophies, theories, whatever. Well, I mean, there's a couple, but they're, they're not as effective as tax sales. Um, so sure. there's assignment of liens. Not, not that, but I meant calculating which ones should be listed for sale or become tax sales? Right, how you define like how wide or narrow your net is for properties that would be impacted by a tax sale. Yeah, this is common practice. I've gotten um, some local towns policies and what they use and they all use three years. They just use a different amount. Some use 10,000, some use 20,000. Just depends on their median values for their town. But the three-year time window, you're saying that's sort of a common industry. You want to call it that practice? Yes. Thanks. Yeah. How many properties are we talking about? Okay. We have, on my list, I have 22 owners 
totaling 30 properties because there's a few owners that own multiple properties um, that haven't paid. So 30 properties in all. And are there's four different like category of, of properties and fees that could trigger something like this. The first one is residential and then there's real estate with no residential um, sewer use fees and assessments mm -hmm. and commercial properties. Do you have an idea of roughly sort of where those 22 folks fall? The majority of them are residential. Um, there's probably a handful, a handful of vacant properties. I don't have any sewer yet. Do we know? And no commercial. Not necessarily percentages, but as far as of the residential, are the majority of those owner occupied? Um, yes, or deceased. Okay. I did There's notice a, couple that are deceased. a lot of estates listed on this list. Yeah. So it's a foreclosure, but you're not, you're gonna put a, a lien on the property for unpaid taxes, right? Are you, are you taking full possession? Are you literally listing? Someone else's, it, it's a public auction process where people sit in a room and literally bid yeah. on the properties and then whoever's the highest bidder receives the property. There's a very long waiting period in between the auction and when they can actually take the property. I think it's over six months that Adam has to hold the property in jeopardy just in case the taxes are received. Um, so someone has a long time. To a very that. long time. And I will say that I've done two of these. I have never had someone be removed from their home. If the home has a mortgage, your mortgage is going to step in and pay off your taxes. There's a lot of other if you have an estate, the estate's going to pop in and pay the taxes. So I think it's a very effective manner of collecting these back taxes without having huge negative implications for for our residents and that was my concern. at this particular moment in time unless someone has really leveraged themselves all over the place like most folks would be able to take out a second mortgage exactly. cover the bill and so there's a question of desire at some level in here absolutely there's no consequence for them to not pay their taxes essentially right now right correct yeah yeah unfortunately uh, I have a question. Um, how about unpaid fines? I'm wondering about that property on Browns Road that's turned into a junkyard, a massive junkyard. They're not. Um, do you know what property? I the, think it's on the list. I, I think I saw it on the list. Yeah, I think not because of the fines, but separately, I think there's also back taxes for a few years over. But the Mansfield Farms LLC. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They're on the list. Okay. Is that what it's called? Mansfield Farms LLC? Yeah. Not Correct. Mansfield Junkyard on. LLC? Oh. <laughs> that may be taken. The, um, when these are, when the house, a house or property is sold, um, let's say $20,000 in taxes, I don't know if that's reasonable, is due. Um, and the property sells for $120,000. What happens to the $100,000 difference? I assume we get the 20. We get, quote unquote, our 20. What happens to the 100? I believe it goes to the owner. Again, Adam handles all of that on his end. Well, that was, yeah, that was my, my question. So he's forced to actually sell and leaves the home. Okay. Or the estate okay. sells it as a way to pay the tax bill. The difference goes to the owner. Correct. And if there's no, if it's a totally abandoned, I mean, now I'm, I know I'm stretching this, but if it were to be totally abandoned, you can't, it's an estate, no heirs apparent. Um, does it just go to unclaimed to the state? Unclaimed? I would have to double check with Adam, but I would think that it goes yeah. to the unclaimed property. Yeah. yeah, I guess it'd be, I mean, yeah, just. Curious to know for sure because I know this was a rub in the town I managed in New Hampshire because under and I don't remember the specifics, but under New Hampshire law, 
the town actually retained the full value of the sale. So there were these situations where there was a substantial amount of back taxes, but the property sold for substantially more than the back taxes. Right. And the town, you know, you can imagine how that might go. Like, oh, the town's profiting. Like, right. the town likes to see this happen because I've they get this big, that, this big windfall. Yeah. Um, yeah, there, yeah, so. I can, we can, Gerald and I can talk to Adam before our next meeting um, and get that information so we know exactly what happens if they come in higher or lower. So it sounds like there's a, a relatively small number of property owners and properties. And if the states are on them, it seems like there's, you know, states can take a long time and don't always react quickly. And is, are there, in your sort of estimation, as you're trying to collect taxes from folks, are there properties that people just have decided consequence so I'm not going to bother to pay or is it usually the case that there's we're just kind of the last on the list of a lot of lists um I think that the majority go ahead Gerald I think that the majority are people that just keep pushing it off and pushing it off because we do receive calls on some of these properties from the owners asking, you know, how much they owed and, you know, what's going to happen to them and, um, you know, what if we don't pay, you know, so. And like Amanda said, we haven't had a tax sale in about six years or so, so. It would be nice to have some sort of, you know, backing or repercussions in this matter. And you said we haven't had one in six years. This is sort of something you do every once in a while all at once. This isn't just some policy that every time someone falls into this category, we engage at it. It really varies process. town by town. I know some towns do them annually. Once a year, they do a tax sale. And that's Answer. just part of their processes. And other towns do it when they feel their list has gotten to a substantial enough point to do that. It's silly. I guess maybe it's not silly, but if you only have one or two properties, the amount of work that goes into it. Well, the auction Gerald, process, Adam. yeah, I think I think there's some threshold, a certain number, because the parties that come in that are interested in bid, I think, it, it, yeah, creates maybe more competition. Correct. So. Got it. And but six years is a long time. It is. Gerald, do you and, have and, okay. and one of the one of the problems is that we charge an 18% uh, interest rate for all of these overdue taxes. So they multiply at a much faster rate than you would expect. Not by choice. I said, not clear, by choice. Said, that's <laughs> state, yeah, right. That's not Mansfield's going right, but yeah. <laughs> do we get that line? Yes. Interest. Gerald, do you have the value of the properties on that list, the amount of taxes that they owe? The total is 711,000 and change. Thank you. So it's a lot for 30 properties. That would be, that's a lot more than 15,000 times mm -hmm. 30, right? Is it a lot more than 15,000? 20,000. 20, 20, yeah, well, because of the interest. 20,000 yeah. and change times 30, yeah. And some of these properties do have more than three years because again we haven't done the tax sale, so it, there's there's some that have mm -hmm. quite a few more years than three. So you're not there's a motion in our packet, but you're. This is a big conceptual item, so we wanted to just have preliminary discussions tonight and get everyone's feedback, um, just to see how finance thought about it, and then I thought at the next meeting we could answer any additional questions. Again, I'll follow up. Um, with Adam about the questions that you guys had, and then we can revisit it again at our next meeting and then move it to the council at that point. And then you'll be wanting a recommendation we'll, for we'll, and Pullman. Correct, yes, so then we would look for a recommendation to appoint Pullman and Conley. And this is sort of one of those weird areas where Gerald has his own independent statutory authority. And so we actually don't have any control over whether or not Gerald decides to write a tax sale policy and hold a tax sale if he wanted to do it himself. Correct. But he would, but we really need to hire an attorney. And so the council right. actually has to 
Okay, the appoint attorney. the attorney mm -hmm. that to do it, but we don't actually get to edit the policy or authorize the sale. Gerald has his own statutory authority where he can do this whenever he wants, as long as, right? That's correct. You have, we, we don't actually get to manage you in, in, in your duties as tax collector directly, Gerald. You're like an assessor where you have your own independent statutory authority. Yes. I've only fought with yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was, that was pays that, for the firm. That was the Gerald? Well, that's an yeah. that's <laughs> so, Gerald, on the $711,000 which you hope to bring in, how would you, you would, if everything gets sold appropriately, how much of that uh, do we have to then give up to uh, Home and Conley? Um, well, Mr. Cohen, Attorney Cohen, would tack on his own um, expenses and fees on top of the um, right. tax sale. I, I saw the rates and, you know, this guy does that. And that. Mm -hmm. What's your sense or knowledge of how much you end up with? What percent do you end up losing um, through attorney's fees and other expenses? We wouldn't lose anything. He could, we wouldn't lose anything. He taxes fees on, on top of the tax amount that's due to us similar to the collection agency. Thank you. <laughs> so, wait, so hold on, if, if, how does it work if somebody- The auction fees, all that is tacked up. Mm -hmm. Right, how does it work if somebody, if the existence of the auction happening motivates someone to take out a home equity line of credit and pay their taxes, does, are we charged with that? Then that's just part of Adam's fee structure. He doesn't get anything in that case. Or, or as soon as he engages, then we're... No, if they pay off first, they just pay off what they owe to Gerald. Yeah, so he only gets his fees if the On sale... On the ones that go to the sale, and yes. Even though in all likelihood, people don't end up evict, foreclosed on and we don't take possession of the house or the buyer doesn't take possession of the house, taxes are paid within that six-month period. He, the, the you, owe, you then owe taxes right. plus auction fees and attorney's fees. Correct. Yep. And I assume that there's someone who's on this list gets, will get notified. Oh, there's so many notices, legal notices. But there's like gotta be a board get, in the town hall with all the items on it. Where, he, where someone starts to owe the fees. Correct. Because I imagine the fees must get pretty darn close to $15,000. Yes, there's a, a significant amount of time, a number, several legal notices that have to go out. Before that, the sale? Correct, before, you before the auction current, actually current happens. Fees. Yes, okay. yes. And if I were going to one of these auctions, understanding that I almost have a 0% chance of buying the house, mm -hmm. the deal is you just get it for very little at these things usually. And so if you do strike gold, you really strike gold. That's yes. the motivation yes. for someone to make that purchase commitment six months out in, in a case where someone really just needs to cough up small, relatively right. small amount of money compared to the value of a home. Okay. That's correct. If there's nothing else, I'll, we will go back and talk to Adam about what happens if you get more or less um, than what is owed to the town and we'll report back at our next meeting and then hopefully we can move this forward then. Okay. okay. If there's any other questions that come up, please reach out and let me know. Gerald, thank you so much for joining tonight. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Gerald. All right. Well, You're welcome. Have a good night. New business for the evening. Uh, are there any communications, other business, or future agenda items? We will get the audit on the next agenda, and we will also bring the tax sale back. Okay. Is there any point at which um, we have any kind of preliminary understanding of the reveal? Mm. I can like before please. everybody finds out, how's, here's how much the town thinks my property is worth now and freaks out. Um, is there any? I can touch base with um, our assessor and see if she has a status update on that. Because they must have gotten, they must be close with the survey process at they this are. point, right? Yeah, they are very close. Yes. And then I imagine it's they have a computer program that they just sort of plug everything into. I think for real estate, we're close. I think for commercial, there's still a handful of inspections that uh, the assessor was hoping to get done with 
the reveal company. She wanted to do them together to make sure they were done. I, I don't think we need a whole presentation. Right. The just council, but I love it. it might be a good committee thing to put on mm -hmm. a future agenda, um, particularly if what we end up with is a grant list that's appreciated by 20 or 30 or more percent on the residential side, which I have to imagine we are going to um, at, at least, if not more. Mm -hmm. um, we probably need to think about a communication strategy at the council and town level about like, hey, actually, we're not, we're going to lower the mill rate by 20 what, or 30 percent. And what, is, what does this mean for stay you? Relatively stable, yeah. even though we're nine months away from passing a budget that actually yeah. makes those changes. It just seems at least, right, it's a year, maybe a year or nine months away. Well, the, the reval that's being done now will set, will be, impact drive what the grand list October 1, 2024 right. is. And it'll be that grand list upon which the FY 2526, so our next budget is yeah. based. So it is the next year. It's just we're talking about FY 26 and October 24 values. And so it kind of sounds like it's two years apart, but really it's not. Yeah, so there's not like a delay, I guess you could say. Like these values will be the values we base the next tax rate on. Correct. Yeah, I, I think it might be helpful to start that conversation before. We certainly hear it all the time. Like people equate my value is going to go up, they're going to give me more taxes. They get pretty kind of walk through how that actually works. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, it'll, there will be plenty of people whose taxes go up and plenty of people whose taxes go down because their property value relative to the rest of the town changes. That's what happened five years ago. Mm -hmm. But um, we're not people, everybody's taxes isn't going to go up by the amount that the value of their homes is going to go up in this reval, which is going to be substantial. So, okay, all right. Anything else? Are we ready to adjourn? Move to adjourn. I'll second it. All right, we are adjourned at 631. <laughs>